things I'm painfully aware of as we talk about employment and disparity. First, it's easy to throw out data on disparities. Understanding the underlying mechanisms is more complex. Not a lot of research is available on the intersection of disability and marginalized communities and employment. And the data that we do have available suffers from a lack of context, physical, social, economic, cultural, political. As a result, the research literature doesn't do a very good job of identifying mechanisms that lead to those disparities and that might create change. We have information on race as a measurable variable, but less understanding of the role of race as a social construct. When talking about intersectionality of disability and marginalized groups, we deal with the population, people with disabilities, who already have very limited access to employment. So we're really talking about a multiplier effect. Second, when we talk about employment, it means really different things to different people. And we need a common language before we have a conversation. We talk about competitive integrated employment and have a very specific meaning for what that is based on the Rehabilitation Act, but basically an individual job that's part of the competitive labor market. But that's not necessarily what other mean people mean when they talk about employment. It's not even necessarily how they use the term competitive integrated employment, and that makes some of these conversations more complicated. Understanding what a valued employment outcome is means going beyond the term competitive integrated employment and listening to advocates. Members of self-advocates becoming empowered and Green Mountain self-advocates worked with us to build a plain language version of the APSI Employment First Policy Statement. They talked about knowing that employment first policies are working when people earn minimum wage or higher, have jobs with benefits, and own and run their own businesses. And more importantly, people work at a job they choose, get promoted, build their career. Liz Weintraub, who was part of our working group for this conference, make a strong, makes a strong point in meetings about the importance of thinking about career paths and not just jobs. Our data on employment doesn't go this deep. Then the complex question becomes, what does a career path mean from an individual's perspective based on their culture and context, their interests and goals, because we all make choices about jobs for different reasons at different times. So where are we today? We're in a time when most states have some sort of employment first policy, at least in writing, that establishes employment as a preferred outcome. We know broadly how many people are employed. Mainstream national economic data tends to focus on the unemployment rate, but because so many people with disabilities have become discouraged and stopped looking for work, it's not really a very useful data point. We focus instead on how many people are working and the disparities there are huge, just simply focusing on disability. The American Communi Community Survey is an important part of those data because it gives us a population view, tells us what people's outcomes are who may or may not be engaged with a public service system. Almost 74% of people without a disability work for pay. It's roughly half that for people with any disability, and it drops down to 30% for people with a cognitive disability, a category that's much broader here than people with an intellectual disability. It includes people with traumatic brain injury, significant learning disabilities, and a wide range of other characteristics. And we know that individuals with an IDD who receive services from a state IDD agency are even less likely to work. Data from the National Core Indicators Project indicates that only 14% of people supported by state IDD agencies worked in a community job in 2020 to 2021. That is down a fair amount from the previous data, 2018 to 2019, because of the impact of the pandemic. But in 1819, it was still only 22% that were employed in some sort of community job. The other part that's useful to think about is one of the contextual factors, along with family, culture, and language, is the impact of poverty. It's not surprising that there's a strong relationship between disability and work and poverty. People with disabilities are much more likely to live in a household that's below the poverty line. And of course, we know we're less likely to work. So for people with no disability, about 10% of people live in a household that has an income, household income that's below the poverty line. 
for people with any disability, that jumps up to 24%. And for people with a cognitive disability, it jumps up to 28%. If you're experiencing poverty, it affects your ability to look for work. It affects your ability to have some flexibility and to get to a job interview, have the right clothing, make the right connections while you're looking for work. It's a critical part of the overall context of a person's relationship to the labor market. Factors like race, culture, ethnicity, gender have a multiplying effect. The overwhelming impact on employment is disability, but then we begin to see an additional level of disparity as we think about race and ethnicity. Let's consider just the differences between people who are black and white. The impact is on both outcomes and services. So starting with the American Community Survey and people who have a cognitive disability, people who are black have a mean annual earnings of about $24,000 compared to $29,000 per year for people who are white. From the National Core Indicators Project, we know that people who are black, only about 14% are working in a community job compared to 20% for people who are white. From a service perspective, the rehabilitation rate for people who work with the vocational rehabilitation system, the rehab rate is the percentage of people who move on to a, a successful employment outcome after receiving services from vocational rehabilitation. That rate's 41% for people who are black, 50% for people who are white. And then returning just finally to the American Community Survey, only 21% of people who are black and have a cognitive disability are employed compared to 28% for people who are white. Shepard et al. in a report from the Institute for Community Inclusion found similar patterns across, race, across other racial and ethnic groups. Individuals with a disability who are Black or Native American are less likely to work and earn less if they do work based on data from the American Community Survey. Looking at RSA data the from the vocational rehabilitation system, individuals who are Black, Native American, Native Hawaiian, or Hispanic are less likely to receive VR services after application and are less likely to be employed following VR services. Um, and finally, from the National Core Indicators Project, individuals with an IDD who are Black, Asian, a Pacific Islander, who, or who identify as Hispanic are less likely to work in integrated jobs. One of the most telling pieces of data we have about people who receive services from state IDD agencies tells us that people who aren't working in the community overwhelmingly want a community job. Overall, in 2020 to 2021, 51% of people who didn't have a community job said that they wanted one. But again, black and white respondents had very different experiences. We know already that people who are black are less likely to work, but they're also more likely to want a job if they're not working in the community. 55% of people who are black said that they wanted a job if they weren't currently working. 41% of people who are white said they wanted a job if they weren't currently working in the community. There are a few emerging qualitative pieces of research that begin to get at people's experiences from different cultural, personal, and community backgrounds that are useful because they begin to get as closer to the core question. So what does this all mean? And how do we take this beyond a superficial look at big group differences that don't always mean very much that when we get down to what a person's experience is in their life? This research is mostly about transition age youth because there are more there is more research on that age group. Courtney Wiltner colleagues um, talked to a diverse group of family members. One of the things that was striking is how infrequently people felt that the school played a significant role in preparing their kids for adulthood. And that feeling came from a variety of places. It came from low expectations. And in many ways, those low expectations were related to a person's personal family characteristics and community characteristics. I'd say low expectations is a broad disability-centric issue, but there was certainly a message from this study about it being a stronger issue for people from diverse groups. Families talked about having limited opportunities for career development and work-related experiences for their children. People simply didn't have experiences that allowed them to make an informed choice about employment and a career path. And finally, families often decided not to engage with paid supports at all because those experiences were so punitive. 
At the same time, the positive part of these stories was that there were examples of people compensating by using the power of personal capital and community relationships that respected who they were and helped them to reach their outcomes. Francis and her colleagues talked to family members from Hispanic households. They talked about poor transition planning and experiences that led to a distrust of educators. And then some things I think that get more at issues that relate to families from diverse or different backgrounds. The overwhelmingness of our systems and how unfamiliar they are and how uncomfortable people are in, try, in trying to interface with systems that are supposed to be supports. There was a lot of conversation about language barriers, lack of interpretation and translation supports. And there was discussion about what people experienced as microaggressions. And one of the strongest of those was being repeatedly questioned about citizenship and eligibility as something that pushed them away from the supports that could be helpful. Families also described a lack of value for cultural differences. For example, families that have a strong focus and cultural focus on interdependence and there being a place for family at the table found conflict with the education and service systems emphasis on independence as a priority. Related to poverty and low wage jobs, families often struggled with schedule availability for communication. It's hard for a family member who's working two jobs to be at an IEP meeting. Many of those barriers resulted in individuals and families having limited information about available resources and supports. In general, the transition literature says individuals and families have limited information about resources, but all of these barriers make access to that information that much more significant and makes it much more difficult to access that information. So where are we headed with this? Much remains to be known about employment for people with disabilities from marginalized and minoritized groups. At the 2022 State of the Science meeting, the members of the employment strand suggested research questions that researchers may wish to pursue in the coming years. Many of these focused on better understanding context and the intersection of individual experiences, community and systems factors. First question has to do with context. What cultural contexts, backgrounds, and experiences need to be understood as we work with individuals to find out what employment means to them and what they want from supports? Second relates directly to the delivery of supports. What's the impact of culturally competent employment specialists on outcomes? And what does it mean to be culturally competent as we support people through the employment process? And how do we address the need for cultural competence, not just at a direct support level, but at a management level and support organizations? Third, how do people get from marginalized groups get information about employment? What would be the best way for people to hear about employment services and options? And how do we get that information to families early? Fourth, as we phase out of subminimum wage and older models of employment and other day services, we need to understand people's experiences and outcomes as those changes happen. Are people's lives better? Finally, we need to build off of Tawara Good's disparities and disability framework to develop measures and build awareness by recognizing and understand the many ways that access is impacted. Tawara reminds us that each of the many systems people have to deal with has a different culture and expectations and process. Achieving employment requires engaging with multiple systems, including education, vocational rehabilitation, IDD services, and managing income supports and health benefits. The disparities in availability, accessibility, acceptability, quality, and utilization of these services can be overwhelming to people. We clearly have a long way to go to make employment an expected outcome for people with disabilities. There are huge gaps between the experiences of people without disabilities and people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in terms of the expectation that they work, in terms of the experiences they have that lead them on a pathway to employment, and the ways that they're supported in getting there. It's clear that those issues and challenges are even greater from people from diverse and marginalized communities. We have a lot of work to do to put together strategies and an understanding of those barriers that's going to help move people to that outcome. Mm -hmm.
Thank you.